was Tenth Committee member of the Mantra and a social student, I guess we don't know. I just want to pose this question to Colin and to anybody else, actually. What do you think are the implications, both positive and negative, on um, actual physical demonstrations coming out of cyber activism? I'm going to give you some background to why I'm asking this question. Um, I, was, I took part in the project for 40 fast recently, you know, they had the 40 day relay. And I see a fellow project 40 faster here. And coming out of it, I realized that now I'm not actually on Facebook or any other social media. And this is a choice I made about a couple of years ago. And I have a dichotomy over it. So first I'll start with project 40, I realized that there were a lot of people that were actually supporting it online. But when it came to any meetings and demonstrations, you would see the same faces over and over again. But you would see activity on the page of people commenting and supporting. They would be aware of the, the events, they would say they're coming, but they don't come. Um, coming out of this year's Silent Silhouettes project too, and also the Sister to Sister project, I know it was actually a strain for Stephanie to gather people to be mentors, even though they supported. Um, the cause and coming out of the silent solar projects that we did this year I know personally because I I am um, organized the physical demonstration aspect of it that I did not get people to come out I actually got two people to come to this demonstration that was still under the lives of 13 women that died because of domestic violence um, so I'm wondering now if it is that people are actually they feel safer or they feel like if cyber activism and social social media is a, is enough, or if, it, if they feel safer, and why you know what are the implications then of cyber activism and social media on people actually being active activists? Because I have to use that word now. <laughs> okay, we'll take a couple of questions so we can get everyone's voices in. Next, I have the microphone just to congratulate the. Um, Angelique for getting this panel together and for being able to attract the, kind, the new dimensions that I think you are bringing to the, to the IGDS conversation. So to thank you for that. I know you did this jointly with our staff on our behalf. Um, the question I wanted to raise is the, the cyber world is uh, still on player one. Because of that virtual space that it allows, we are not quite sure what it maps, what is a, you know, what is real and what is unreal, um, what is the performance of it, you know, what is people's true attempt to reach and create identity and so on. Um, and therefore, it begs my second question about not so much the I like the question about whether it's a safe space or not, but whether there's an assumption almost that it is a youthful space. Where does youth begin and edge end in the cyber world? And how much does this not really appreciate where age is still, you know, youth is not cut off, that, that there is a space that um, even in, in situations like this where um, wisdom and age are very much part of how that conversation may be propelled. While, while with um, age, some people get more stuck in their ways. Obviously, others actually are um, quite open, and there's a whole other community there. And I know for a fact, if I, if I use the example of how St. Norman Govan, as a scholar, has been able to use the, the old cyber world um, and cyberspace with his blogs and so on to influence and change ideas and, and to create a whole discourse around the CSME and, and, and the Caribbean. You know, there is, a, there is a value of engaging across um, age as well, in ways that maybe we haven't considered. One more question, and then let's wrap up with the panel. I have um, a question that I want to premise is more of a challenge and a criticism, because I commend everybody for at least doing something, and that's a lot more, you know, or starts with one step. But I have a concern following your question about but the question is essentially about this gap between the pre-Facebook days and now. In the sense that the, with the advent of the internet, which spawned this democratization of information and so on and so forth, um, it's almost as if 
it encourages anonymity. And the flip side of it is it could discourage empirical research. The statistics that are gleaned when people submit their stories. I mean, I'm going to embellish a little bit <laughs> in lost some characteristics. And in, in terms of testing the veracity of it and so forth. And I wonder if it has discouraged us as a society. Because what I'm hearing is a lot of pandering going on. Because I do believe having worked as you know, with policy makers and so forth that people do read reports those who are in important places, because I can't cite um, you know, Facebook as a credit, as a creditable source and so on. I mean, it's important as well, but I wonder if we walk away just please, like, I like the status, and it's from foreign, as we say, and that is the end of it. And um, emanating from that is uh, two observations that, that I've made. One in the sense of the intersectionality, it was mentioned earlier in terms of the question of, of essentialization was raised. What I've observed is when you attend certain events such as this one, you see a certain group of people. And when I attend the Trayvon Martin event, you don't see the same people. But yet you hear that, you know, a victory for equality is a victory for one. And, and as I said, I have such a respect for advocates. But sitting on the other side, on the government side, I always, um, advocate to challenge ourselves as there's such an august responsibility where we sit. You know, you hear there's a backup. Do advocacy groups support each other? Does gender support race? You know, a Muslim woman, experience, lesbians experience is not the same as a necessarily Hindu, by curious male, married, <laughs> or, you know, and, you know, and it's important to have those studies. That's one observation, just in terms of how we align with wider equality struggle. And secondly, and this is a really heartfelt observation because I don't want to give out my age, right? So, um, but I was just thinking that with the, with the advent of the internet, it's a tremendous archival um, possibility. And where does one go? You know, the advocates, traditional advocates, pre-cyber advocates, you know, the young lady mentioned, the, the demographic is 21 to 25, but where does one go and find out about, you know, the first woman who died, whose friend died of AIDS and went to an advocacy movement, about what we see about Denny, about Mr. Carr, about Didi and Barbados, about certain regional advocates that had to go on the road, hand out condoms at parties, you know, even the owner of certain actual social spaces, the first gay clubs and meetings in Trinidad and it was that people would dress up in suits and, and all of those things. Where does one go in terms of finding out about your actual history? You know, it's always sad, you know, you go on the Kaisu webpage, you might see a little blurb, or I think as a meme they call it, rest in peace, so and so. But who was so and so? You know, in terms of the actual story and the actual war. Because what I caution is about, it is excellent what is happening, but as Colin mentioned, there is a background, as he said, with Hazel Brown. But how many people know who Hazel Brown actually is and what her contribution is and that sort of work? So it's just a challenge of whether cyber activism acknowledges the period before that does exercise the responsibility to preserve those people who we as a people, you know, gay, straight, I mean, even to enjoy metrosexuality as yes. men are enjoying. There were a lot of people who got stoned for their fashion sense, and those were advocates in their own way. So, if you could just um, answer that, I'd be grateful. Welcome. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, and so, strategically picking the places where that will happen, and, you know, balancing impact with risk, and there's no formula for that. Any other responses? Just to add to what um, Colin said, um, with the online activism, yes, it provides that a shield, a shield from, you know, who, if you stand up outside by the road holding a placard, somebody can tell something at you, but they can't necessarily do that if you're online. So it does provide that kind of protection and barrier. But I think the main issue for why people aren't participating uh, publicly in physical act, um, protests is because they feel they don't have a stake. They feel as though whatever it is that you're protesting, I, my 
position is comfortable enough that this doesn't really affect me in so much of a way that I need to speak out about it. Uh, if people felt they need to speak out, they would show up. So I think it's just about people cultivating that idea that yes, we do lead in sectional lives and yes, what is happening with the highway route is affecting me because of my sexuality, is affecting all of these other issues and, and we need to link these things together and realize that we do have states. Yeah, all that protest even makes a difference. Yeah, the idea, some people <laughs> yeah, think that, you know, it makes no difference. Nothing is going to change, nothing is going to happen after, so why bother? I wanted to talk about the age. I just wanted to share some of the data from Caramus. 46% of the sample were from 20 to 29, and 29 was the median age. 25% of the sample was 30 to 39, and those were the biggest blocks. However, 15%, 40 to 49, and 7% were over 50. And one of the one of the interesting findings was there's something in the report called internalized homophobia, which is really self-stigma. And what we found was that the older men got the more they got over it. And I thought that was an important message there in terms of the fact that things may seem really rough now in school, um, being a young MSM in the workplace, but as you grow older, you figure things out. And as you figure things out, you're better able to manage your health. Um, you're better able to guard yourself from STIs, um, to negotiate safer sex and so on. So yes, it's a predominantly youthful audience, but there are older people online and there is a space for them to share their experiences, I really think.